I trust that's a prayer that you pray every day and many, many times during the day. Amen? That's a prayer you can wake up praying. Oh, Lord, I need you. Well, it's been a wonderful week. I don't know about you, but I hope it's been for you, too, uh, with all that nice rain we got. And uh, understand you might have got up to eight inches over this way. I think where I was, I know my rain uh, gauge showed five and a half inches, and I first looked at it and thought, goodness, it didn't even rain here. They said it was going to rain. But what happened is when I looked at it, it was full to the top and running over, and it looked like it was clear with nothing in the rain gauge. <laughs> and I thought, goodness. So who knows how much we got where we are there. But uh, again, uh, just a t little testimony on Friday. Uh, afternoon, I had the privilege of speaking to the Dixon High School football team. Uh, we provided a meal for them, and uh, since we provided a meal for them, I know that's your enemy over there in from Pender County. I know over that county is a little different, but uh, but anyway, we we were able to speak to them for about 15, 20 minutes and share from the Bible. Can you believe that in the school in the cafeteria? from the Bible, the Word of God, and the truth of God's salvation, and give them a little bit of our testimony and really encourage them from 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We get knocked down, and I basically kind of use the thing about uh, football. It's about knocking the other guy down, and you're going to get knocked down. And, uh, but, of course, that passage says we're knocked down, but we're not knocked out. We can get back up for the glory of God. And so we had a wonderful time. Thank you. Thank the Lord for letting us speak to the team. And uh, this morning, I just want to mention uh, Donna and Rodney are back with us after being out for a long time and uh, still recovering. We're going to try our best to keep them healthy, okay, over these next weeks. Amen, Donna. Rodney, he had broke his arm and the shoulder there, his arm actually, and uh, went through that uh, long, was that earlier this year or last year already? earlier this year, and then Donna broke her foot and has had a really tough time with it, and it's just really good to see them back. And then also I have my son, uh, Nathan, and uh, his family, his wife, Karn, and Caitlin, and Ashlyn, and my other grandson, Peyton, and uh, their son, Braden Paul, um, and uh, of course my wife, Edith, she comes with us regularly. So we're glad to... <laughs> Of course, my wife Edith. <laughs> no, we love her, of course. And uh, but uh, Nathan uh, on Tuesday will be uh, uh, pinned and get a promotion with the, with the Navy. He'll be, uh, and matter of fact, we're going to go to the ceremony. Edith and I will in Norfolk, Virginia, and he'll become a lieutenant commander in the Navy. And on Tuesday, and uh, he's in transfer mode down to Kings Bay, Kings Bay Submarine Base. So he'll be a chaplain down there. For the next several years and so you can pray for the whole family as they make that transition so what a uh, interesting week it'll be for us now do we have children's church today oh good so everybody gets to stay in this is this is good i was hoping that would be the case i can't keep up with that i can't keep up with that uh oh, one last thing i knew i was forgetting one thing uh and that is on uh, September the 24th, September 24th, that's uh, not sure if it's the last Sunday, but September the 24th, Sunday, uh, we'll be st I'll be starting a class for people that are interested in joining the church and new members or new converts, okay? So if you're interested in that class, it'll be at 945 along with the other Sunday schools, and we'll be meeting and we'll be doing first steps. So it'll be a class that'll just introduce you to the church, introduce you to the first steps in the Christian life. And so it's a combination membership class and first steps class. And so that'll be on September the 24th, we'll be starting that class. So you might say, hey, I'll get there a little earlier. And uh, if you're not already coming and be a part of that class with us. And we'd look forward to that. I'd like to start my, my message this morning. I'll be preaching on Daniel. Becoming a first-class world changer. We're going to be looking at Daniel today. Daniel, the life of Daniel and how God used him to be a first-class world changer. But before I read the scripture, I want to ask you a question. Would you believe somebody, would you believe somebody that you really didn't know but you had heard that they are a liar? 
And they have a reputation for being a liar. Maybe you even know them and you know that they're a liar. So when you talk to them, do you put your trust in what they say or do you say, hmm, I better question this. I had a, had a friend and uh, this is years and years ago. His name is Jimmy and he was a big time hunter. He is a redneck hunter. And, uh, and he had become pretty close friends with me and he always want me to go hunting with him. But for some reason, I got to know him a little bit. He ended up in prison later too, so I was a really good influence on him. But, uh, but, uh, but I'll never forget, he'd want me to go hunting with him. And, and I'm a pastor and, and I wanna keep my reputation intact. And so he'd say, hey, let's go fox hunting. And I would say, oh goodness, how do you do that? And he'd say, oh I'll, man, I'll show you, we'll have a great time. Or he'd say, let's go duck hunting. Or he'd say, let's go quarrel hunting or something like that. And I'd say, oh, I'd love to go. But I can tell you what I always did. I always called the game warden <laughs> and found out, is this in season and do you need a license? <laughs> okay, because I didn't want to get in trouble, right? But, but would you put your trust in somebody if you knew they were a liar? I mean, would you trust them with your life? I mean, you know, every time we get on an airplane, I often think about it. I think, wow, all of us people are putting our trust in that pilot up there. I sure hope he didn't lie about his credentials. Now, I don't think about that really strongly because I hope he's been vetted very well, all right, because I wouldn't want to be scared to death the whole time in flight that it's not going to get where it's supposed to go. But... Uh, but today, as we talked about in Sunday school, we live in a day of deceivers, in a day of liars. And the Bible even speaks about the fact that in the last days, this will be the conditions. And when the Antichrist comes, he's going to come with lying wonders. He's going to make you think this is the truth and deceive you so you believe the lie. Now, the end of all liars... The Bible tells us in Revelation 22, and all liars will have their part in the lake of fire. That's what the scripture says. Jesus said to the Pharisees, you are of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. He is a liar from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. And so I'm going to be talking about being a world changer especially in a culture today of lies, a day where people are being lied to day in and day out through media, through government, through churches and religious leaders. And how do we make a difference in that kind of culture? Now, I want to read a passage. It's a rather long passage first to start our message in John chapter 17. If you have your Bibles, I'd love for you to turn to if you brought your personal Bible and maybe even look for one word. There's one word that's going to get repeated over and over again. Now, I'm not going to tell you what the word is as we prepare to read it, but uh, you see if you catch it, okay? See if you see it. I didn't underline it or highlight it on my screen up here either, but... Uh, but listen to this passage. Now, John chapter 17, Jesus is praying his high priestly prayer before he goes to Calvary to die on the cross for us. And so this is in the inner sanctum. This is in the Holy of Holies. Jesus is pouring out his heart to his father. And he's praying basically for his disciples and he's praying for us, as you'll see in this passage. And there's a word that he mentions over and over again in this, these verses that we'll be reading, beginning in verse 11. And so Jesus is praying to his father and he says, now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to you, holy father, keep through your name, those whom you have given me that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me, I have kept, and none of them is lost except the son of perdition, that the scriptures might be fulfilled. Now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, 
And the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I'm not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, I've also sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also may be sanctified by the truth. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. That's where Jesus is praying for us today because we have believed in him because of the word that's been passed down over the last uh, two millennial. And then Jesus went on to pray that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. Now, I'm curious, did you kind of catch the word that's repeated many, many times? What was it? World. The world hates Jesus. He said the world's going to hate you. He says the Father sent me into the world, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. Remember the gospel of John last week? We talked about key words, the word believe, but also the word world, because the gospel of John was for the world, for all of us. We've been sent into the world. As the Father sent him into the world, so we are being sent by Jesus into the world. And then if you'd like to, for a brief moment here, would you stand? And I'm going to read from Daniel chapter 2. Now, this is the end of the story that we'll be talking about in Daniel chapter 2. As you know, Daniel was in the captivity in Babylon, the nation of Israel, a time and time again, uh, followed uh, the heathen practices of worshiping Baal, going into idolatry, uh, and God would send judges, he would send punishment, he would send other nations to punish them, and they would get delivered sometimes miraculously, but finally God said, that's enough, and he sent them into Babylonian captivity. And there Daniel was in captivity, and the king answered Daniel and said, as King Nebuchadnezzar, truly your God is a God of gods. Now this is, remember, this is the king of the world, King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, the head of gold. And he's acknowledging that the king, the God of Daniel is the God of gods, the Lord of lords, and a revealer of secrets, since you could reveal this secret. Then the king promoted Daniel and gave him many great gifts, and he made him ruler over the province of Babylon and chief administrator over all the wise men of Babylon. And also Daniel petitioned the king, and he set Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon, but Daniel sat in the gate of the king. Now, Father, I pray in these next moments as we talk about Daniel being a first-class world changer, someone who changed the culture of the world around him and impacted the world that he lived in. And Lord, how that we, if we're going to make a difference, it's going to take each of us individually as believers to be world-class culture changers, world changers. Help us understand what that means and what it entails today and help us to be like Daniel, to dare dare to be different, dare to stand up for truth and to proclaim your word in our lives as we live it and as we speak it. And we ask these things in Jesus' name and God's people say, amen. You can be seated. Now, Daniel is a great model and example of what it means to be a first class world changer. Now, we can either conform to the culture of the world we live in, or we can determine to influence and change the culture of the world we live in. Now, when we talk about culture, this is important. Culture refers to those shared beliefs, those shared values, customs, arts, the norms of a specific group of people. And culture oftentimes plays a major role in shaping the lives 
of the younger generation that grow up during that time and place. We talk about the culture of the workplace, the culture at home, the culture at school, the culture of your church. For instance, at Rainbow, at Rainbow, at Friendly Community here, our culture is friendly. <laughs> Amen? It, it is. It's known to be a friendly church. You're going to get your hands shook. You're going to have somebody speak with you, pray with you, encourage you. It's a culture of friendliness. The culture of your neighborhood or community. When we first moved into our neighborhood we're in, and I'm not trying to be critical of it today too much, too much. Uh, but boy, I mean, coming to, coming to North Carolina in this particular neighborhood, it just seems like you have to wave at everybody that goes past you. you, you I mean, if so, it doesn't matter whether you're on a bicycle, you're in a car, you're in a golf car. It doesn't matter. You wave. You wave to everybody. You say, just wave. I mean, you, and if somebody doesn't wave, we say, Bet they're from New York or something. <laughs> but but, but uh, th th that, that appeared to be the culture. It appeared to be the culture. Friendly. Man, we love this neighborhood. Now, we've been there for two years, and we're on a Facebook page with our neighborhood. Oh, goodness sakes. Now, sometimes the culture of that Facebook page can be very nasty and mean and mean-spirited and negative. And they call you out if your dog gets loose. Fortunately, I don't have a dog. Or your dog does something in their yard. So there's the culture of our neighborhoods, the culture of our state, North Carolina, the culture of our nation. You hear terms like a godless culture. And when you think of, uh, think of a godless culture, uh, for instance, today, you probably could say we live in a time of a godless culture in our nation, a culture of violence, a culture of hate, a culture of greed and materialism, a culture of rebellion, a culture of disrespect, a culture of immorality. That's the culture. And you might even say, okay, what is a God-fearing culture? Well, that's a culture of love, a culture of kindness, a culture of gener gener generosity, a culture of respect and personal responsibility. And of course, if you had your choice to live in a culture of violence, hate, greed, materialism, rebellion, disrespect, immorality, or a culture of kindness and, and goodness and generosity, I mean, what would you pick? I don't know about you. I'd want to live in a culture that is a God-fearing culture. Now, America at one time had a culture that reflected the values of a, and listen to this word, this term, a biblical world view. We might call that a Christian culture. But a few years ago, we went into a post-Christian culture. And sad to say, today, it appears that we're living in an anti-Christian culture culture. We're hearing more and more about believers because they speak up for the word of God or take a stand on the word of God. They're actually being persecuted and prosecuted and going to jail in some cases for that. A godless culture. Well, that's the kind of world that Daniel was thrown into when he was taken into captivity to Babylon. But instead of conforming to the culture around him, he, by the grace of God, became a culture world changer. Daniel, is, as, as you should read the scripture, it's obvious that he was a person who had deep and great faith in his God. Three times in the scripture, Daniel was called a man greatly beloved. In Daniel 10, verse 11, verse 19, Daniel 9:23. And he said to me, O Daniel, man, greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak to you. Which means he was a man who pleased God, greatly beloved. He pleased God. Why? Hebrews eleven six. 6, without faith it's impossible to please God. For he that comes to God must believe that he is, and he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Daniel was a man of deep faith. 
a man who believed God, a man who pleased God. Now, where did his faith come from? And where will your faith come from? Romans 10, 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Remember, Jesus often would say, oh, you a little faith. And sometimes we look at our faith and we say, oh, God, my faith is so little. Matter of fact, the disciples even prayed one time, Lord, increase our faith. How do you increase your faith? A couple ways. The number one way, though, is to be in the word of God. Read it, reread it, memorize it, meditate on it. I mean, think about it as much as you possibly can. As the Old Testament tells us in Deuteronomy 6, write it on the doorposts on both sides. Write it on the lintel of your house. I had friends of mine who were writing it on the walls of their houses. When I go to visit them, they would have verses on the walls all through the house because they wanted to make sure their children are growing up seeing the truths of God's word visibly, knowing God's word and hiding God's word, living in God's word, making sure it's deep in your heart. You want faith. And if there's one thing we need to be world changers, we need faith in God. And it comes from his word. Secondly, it comes and grows as we are tried. A faith that is not tested is not a real faith. Your faith will be tested. And that's why the trying of your faith produces patience. Patience what? Waiting on God, persevering, sticking in there, not giving up. That's a faith that's real. It's genuine. James chapter 1 and chapter 2. And so that's the kind of faith that Daniel had. It comes by the word of God. 1 Thessalonians 2.13, Paul wrote to the church at Thessalonica, for this reason we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which works effectively in you who also believe. The Bible is a living book. Hebrews tells us the word of God is quick. It means it's alive. It's a living book. It's quick. It's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces even to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit, the joints and marrow. It's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The word is like a mirror, James says. When you look in the mirror, you see what you really look like, if you dare to look. Right? And so, especially as you get older, you want to look at it less and less. But the Word of God lets you see what your heart is really like as you read it. It's a mirror. It reflects to you what is in the depths of your heart, your soul, and your life. But not only does it do that, it's quick, it's alive. It deals with it. It tells you what's right in your life and what's wrong in your life. It tells you what your motives are that shouldn't be there and helps clean them up so you have the ones that you should have. That's the word of God. It works effectively in you believe. Paul's parting words to the elders at the church at Ephesus was in Acts chapter 20, verse 32, and he had already told them, this is the last time I'm getting to talk to you. After this, you'll see my face no more. And his last words were, so now, brethren, I commend you to God I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Wow, don't you like that? I cannot emphasize enough how you should read your Bible, how you should be in the word, how you should systematically be going through the whole Bible because all scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. All scripture, that means from Genesis 1, verse 1 to the last verse in Revelation 22. All scripture. And Jesus said it this way, man shall not live by bread alone, but by Every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. You said, what word is that? It's right here. God's given us his final word right here. And so faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now, you know Daniel, who he was, many of you, as you studied through the Bible. As a teenager, he was in that very first group of captives that were taken to Babylon in about 650 B.C. by King Nebuchadnezzar. 
read Daniel chapter 1. And he was chosen to go there because he was of noble descent. He was a kid that was very sharp and very wise. And, uh, and he was going to be brought to Babylon. And Nebuchadnezzar's goal was to turn these guys into Babylonians, Chaldeans. To make them look like and sound like and have the wisdom of the world. They were going to change them into Babylonians and change their worldview. And so when they got them there, guess what they did with them? They put them in a three-year Babylonian university. University of Chaldea, maybe. And for three years, they were going to learn the language of the Chaldeans. They're going to learn the culture of the Chaldeans. And they're going to be brainwashed and influenced into what the Chaldeans and how they see the world which really centered around basically one person who was Nebuchadnezzar, the head of gold, and he wanted to be worshipped himself, as you see later in the book. Matter of fact, they changed their names, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, to Shadrach. Their names were, I mean, if I ask you, what were the names of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? What were their Hebrew names? Without looking, could you tell me? Now, don't ask me either, all right? I'd have a hard time. But I looked it up, of course, because I'm reading that passage of Scripture this week. Uh, but Hananiah, Michelle, or almost Michael, and Azariah. As a matter of fact, we had a dear friends back in uh, Roanoke. They named one of their sons Azariah after one of these three Hebrew kids. We know them by their Chaldean names, their Babylonian names, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Interesting, we don't know Daniel by his... Uh, Chaldean name, which was Belshazzar. Belshazzar actually means may Baal, the god of Baal, protect his life. That's what his name was given to him. But somehow he hung on that other name, Daniel. Daniel, some people say, means beautiful. And that's one, I guess, application of his name. But it means God is judge. When you see E-L, remember in a name like Michael, Mike L., E-L is at the end of my name. Okay, so my name has the name L, God, in the name. And Michael, Mike, the first part of it, Micah, it's basically, <laughs> I have a hard name. I can't live up to my name. That's all I can tell you. The, the name Michael means he who is like God. Okay, Daniel means God is judge, my judge. Dan is judge, means judge. God is my judge. <laughs> So they changed their names. They changed their names. They changed their diet to please, uh, to appease their fleshly appetites. But Daniel was a man and a person of conviction. And so as he gets put in this university and they try to change his name and they change his diet, it says in verse 8, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. So he's presented with this. This is the food you have to eat. This is where it's going to be for the next three plus years. And he says, I want to make an appeal. And he makes an appeal. Daniel dared to be different. And I'm telling you, that's pretty hard in this world for our teenagers today. The peer pressure and everything else that comes with it, it's hard to take a stand to be different. But Daniel made up his mind he was not going to compromise in this culture. And why? Because he had a belief based on and grounded in biblical truth. Now, let me point out several things about Daniel as he does this. One, Daniel didn't rebel or have a bad attitude toward those who were over him or around him. Look in verses 8 and 9. He requested of the chief eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now, God had brought Daniel into favor and the goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. Of the chief of the eunuchs. Daniel had favor with the man who was in charge of him. How did he do that? By being mean, rambunctious, rebellious, 
insubordinate. No, no, no. He must have been a person of kindness and generosity, and he listened. He paid attention. He did what he could do without compromising his standards and his beliefs in God's word. So he had gained the confidence and favor of this man who was in charge of him. You know, Jesus, Jesus told us, in this world you shall have tribulation. Jesus said, blessed are you when you're persecuted for my name's sake. In this chapter, John 17, 16, in these verses, Jesus said, the world's going to hate you just like it hated me. That's the conditions you're going to have to face and live with in reality if you're going to be a true follower of Jesus Christ. And that's a tough one, but it's the reality of what it means to be a believer who has a biblical worldview. Daniel was willing to be observed in verse 12 and 13. So he made the appeal and the guy said, oh goodness, I can't do that. If you guys don't eat this good food and look as good and healthy as everybody else, <laughs> my head comes off. And Daniel said, at least give us 10 days. Test us for 10 days. Daniel was willing to be observed. And you know what? We're going to have to be willing to be observed. Hey, don't, don't, don't judge me. That's what we want to say. Don't judge me because I'm different. No, say, no, it's okay. Daniel said, test your servant for 10 days. Let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance be examined before you and the appearance of the young men who eat the portion of the king's delicacies as you see fit so deal with your servants and Daniel basically said I'm not asking you to believe what I believe but watch me but watch me so he didn't try to change them he just said watch me and as, as believers we should be able to do that I'm not trying to convert you to what I believe that's not my job to convert anybody I can't do that anyway and if I did it it wouldn't mean anything we want God to speak to their hearts. And God speaks to people's hearts because they see a difference in our lives. Daniel, we, write, we read, not only was he different, but I'm, I'm telling you, my friend, he was better. And at Daniel 1.15, and at the end of 10 days, their features appeared better and fatter in flesh than all the young men who ate the portion of the king's delicacies. I want to tell you, when, when you make a decision to say, I'm going to do it God's way, I'm going to be the best I can for the glory of God, you don't have to compromise your belief in what the Word of God says because in the end, you will shine. Some of the greatest athletes, and I wish we had story, time to tell the stories of some of these great, great athletes, won the gold medal, set, I mean, set the standard high and would not compromise in the face of the whole world turning against them in a sense. And then God using them in a miraculous way to bless all of us, even to their stories today. Not only different, but better. Now, what was Daniel's convictions based on? What was his convictions based on? You know what I believe? I believe when Daniel was a little boy, he's growing up in the city of Jerusalem, no doubt. And you know who the prophet was at that time he was growing up in Jerusalem? A prophet by the name of Jeremiah. And Jeremiah was preaching. And maybe Daniel had even enrolled and been a part of a class that Jeremiah would teach. And he heard these messages from Jeremiah. He knew Jeremiah was writing a book maybe that would become a part of the Bible because later in captivity, Daniel's got the book of Jeremiah and he's reading through it and sees that the captivity is only going to be 70 years long because it's in the book of Jeremiah. So he sits in a great school there and he's influenced by some wonderful people. And honestly, our children are being influenced at the youngest of ages today by the world around them or the environment and the culture that we're allowing them to be a part of in their youngest, youngest years. Daniel probably had some great parents who did everything they could to teach him a biblical truth. He said under Jeremiah's teaching and Daniel had a biblical worldview. Now here's the question. What is a biblical worldview? What's a worldview? 
A worldview is the framework from which we view reality and make sense of life and the world around us. Let me repeat that. Maybe it's on the screen. A worldview is the framework from which we view reality and make sense of life and the world around us. You see, somebody with a biblical worldview believes his primary reason for existence is to love and serve God. That's why we're here, basically. If you have a biblical worldview, I exist to love and serve God. I don't exist to be happy. I don't exist to have my way. I don't exist just to have children and have a family and go through life and have a good job. I exist to love God, to love God and give him glory in my life as I serve him. Now, whether conscious or subconscious, every person has some type of worldview. And a personal worldview, your worldview, is a combination of all that you believe to be true and what you believe then becomes the driving force for every emotion, decision, and action that you take. And therefore, it affects every response to every area of your life. You see everything in the, in the framework of your worldview. For instance, the wor your Christian or your worldview determines the reality of several things. Listen to this. Your origin. Where did I come from? Where did everything come from? Who am I? Your identity. What am I? Meaning. I mean, what am I on life for? What am I on earth for? Why am I here? Your morality. How should I live my life? My destiny. What happens when I die? I mean, your worldview is going to tell you the answer to those questions as far as you're concerned in your life. Now, this is kind of sad, but it's true. A recent nationwide survey completed by the Barna Research Group determined, this is sad, determined that only 4% of Americans today have a biblical worldview. 4%. You wonder what's happening and why people are responding the way they respond and they vote the way they vote. They don't have a biblical worldview today. When, John, John, when George Berna also researched cultural trends and the Christian church, which he's been doing since 1984, he looked at the born again believers in America. They told us that there are some 50 million, quote, claiming to be born again believers in America. And when he surveyed these people, guess what he found out? Only, and this is sadder still, 9% of the Christians, quote Christians, born again Christians, sitting in our churches have a biblical worldview. That ought to shake us up. Even we sometimes who claim to be followers of Christ have been so taken in by the world in our way of being trained and thinking that we don't even have a biblical worldview ourselves. So what is a biblical worldview? I think I've already said it, but let's just repeat it. A biblical worldview is based on the infallible word of God. We talked about this in Sunday school. When you believe the Bible is entirely true, then you allow it to be the foundation of everything you say and do. The opposite of a biblical worldview would be called a non-biblical worldview. All right? That's pretty good, isn't it? Smart. It would be called a secular worldview or a humanistic worldview. Matter of fact, if you ask me what the religion of America is today, the major the major religion to America, of America today, I, I, would, I would personally say it's a humanistic religion. It's humanism. Humanism is the religion of the world today. And it's actually Romans chapter 1. And you know what it is? We worship the creature rather than the creator. That's a humanistic worldview. We worship ourselves. What do you want? What do you desire? What makes you happy? That's humanism. Have it your way, the advertisement says, right? You deserve it. 
You hear it over and again. Why? That's a humanistic worldview. Now, that's why two people can look at the same evidence in geology, history, science, and they come up with two totally different conclusions. If you've never had the chance to watch the Truth Project, if you've never had the chance to watch the Truth Project, man, I would just encourage you, look it up on YouTube or somewhere and get that, because this really would help you see what we're talking about. That's why an atheistic, humanistic scientist will look at the exact same evidence in geology as a biblical worldview scientist and come up with a totally different conclusion about the same evidence. Uh, and it's almost the same as going to a basketball game. You're sitting on the side of the fans that are for the home team. The other fans on the other side, they're the away team. And you're watching the ball game and something happens in the ball game. The people on the other side, as the ref makes a call, they say, no, no, no. And we're sitting on the other side. It's our home team. We're saying, yes, yes, yes. And we're convinced he got the right call. They're convinced he did the wrong call. Why? Because they already got their mind made up what the call should have been. That's how our worldview affects us almost in every area of life. Amen? And you know how true that is. So let me ask you, do you have a biblical worldview? Now here's some of the questions that George Barna used in his survey. Okay, I'm going to give you a test. So say yes or no, or try to answer in your head. Do you believe absolute moral truths exist? I can remember sitting in my, this. I'm, I'm, I graduated in 1969, so my senior year English class, 1969. How many years ago was that? 50 years ago, plus. I'll never forget that English teacher. She had her master's, double master's, teaches in the university also. And she got in front of us and she says, there are no absolutes. And of course, we wanted to say to her, are you absolutely true, sure about that? <laughs> You're supposed to laugh anyway. <laughs> I didn't know enough to say that to her. Second question, is absolute truth defined by the Bible? Yes or no? Did Jesus Christ live a sinless life? Yes or no? Is God the all-powerful and all-knowing creator of the universe, and does he still rule it today? Is salvation a gift from God that cannot be earned? Is Satan real? Does a Christian have a responsibility to share his or her faith in Christ with other people? Is the Bible accurate in all of its teachings? By the response I've got so far, it sounds like we've got a biblical worldview in here. Today, we're living in a Babylonian culture, and we can either conform or be transformed. We can survive, just survive, or my friend, we can thrive. We can let it change us, or we, by the grace of God, can be world changers. And let me just go through a couple things that are happening, hopefully, that'll just help wake us up to say, by the grace of God, I want to be a Daniel. You see, in America, what is considered normal today was considered abnormal 30, 40 years ago. The culture changes the norms, the standards based on the prevailing worldview. And some of these notes, actually, I took from some lessons a student of mine taught, John Stone Street, who is the speaker on Breakpoint on, the, on, on, uh, on radio and in the nation. He's the president of the Christian uh, of the Colson Center for Biblical Worldview. Uh, John Stone Street grew up under our ministry up in Winchester, Virginia. And matter of fact, Nathan back here went to school and played basketball with John Stone Street. I think John was a little older than you. And John is an intellectual. He went on to school and learn, and now God's using him all across the world, literally, 
teaching biblical worldview and where America is today. And you can listen to him on Breakpoint every day. So if you just find out what Breakpoint is, listen to him. But John kind of pointed these things out, and I copied them from him. You know, there was no telephone in America till 1876. There were some telegraph lines before then. But then we ended up, after that, a dial-up phone on a party line. Anybody remember? You can tell your age if you remember the party lines, but I remember party lines. I don't have time to talk about that stuff, but, but uh, uh, yeah, your neighbor, remember your neighbor? You were on the party line with your neighbor, and the phone would ring at your house, too, you guys that don't know about it. And if you were like, uh, like I want to know what's going on, you would answer it and act like you didn't answer it and listen to what somebody's telling your neighbor. It's a party line. But then finally they got it down to a personal landline at your house, which was nice. You had your own. You didn't have to worry about that anymore. And then next thing you know, they have a and t puts out these things called wireless telephones in your house. You didn't have to have them connected to a wire. You could walk around and talk on those and still have those these days, I guess. And then a large car phone came out with antenna on top, a big antenna on the top and big old thing in your car. And boy, if you were rich and had the money to buy one of those things and get connected, even though it didn't connect very well, you got one. And I can remember those days just thinking, oh, I wished I had one of those. And then it turned into a personal flip phone. Remember the flip phones? Now today, it's a smartphone. You don't know how hard it was for my wife to give up her flip phone. <laughs> Actually, I gave her several of my smartphones and she threw them in the trash. She did not want them. She wanted her flip phone. Now we can't take her smartphone out of her hand. <laughs> Today, a flip phone is abnormal, Edith. <laughs> she still wants her flip phone probably. Now listen to this. We go from what began as unthinkable to become what is now unquestionable. Marriage. When we were kids growing up, one man, one woman married for life. But today, homosexuality, transgender, gender transitioning going on, abortion, infanticide, euthanasia. Today, that's considered normal in this country. John went on to say... The most dangerous ideas in society are not the ones being argued, but the ones that are being assumed. It's called the screen. The screen. The screen has taken over. TVs, iPads, notebooks, computers. Tech has captured pretty much all visual capacity. Today, you're hearing about AI, AI, artificial intelligence. Americans listen, spend three to four hours a day looking at their phone. This, this sad thing is some of them are looking at them when they're driving, which is very dangerous. And about 11 hours a day, 11 hours a day, 11 hours a day looking at screens of any kind. Average Americans, 11 hours a day looking at screens of any kind. They, they work, they have to, they're working with a computer. Smartphones can destroy a generation because social media is telling our children how to live their lives instead of the Bible forming what our standards are or how we should live in the world. Social media in the world is telling us what we should think should be true and what should be valuable. In other words, we've lost touch with ourselves. Listen to these truths that John Stone Street pointed out. We've traded knowledge for, and wisdom for information because I can become my own authority because I have all the information. And I'm amazed at this little thing right here. I, could, I can ask, hey, Siri, and I shouldn't have said that because now she's going to try to talk to me. <laughs> I mean, that is unreal. And I can ask about anything in the world, and I'm going to have a host of information available right this minute to give me the answers from whatever she gathers that information or whoever Siri is. And then I think I have the authority because I know, because I 
heard it from her or whoever. But that's a big lie. We've traded holiness for image. The big lie is I am who I define myself to be. Listen to that. That's what the lie is today. I am what I define myself to be. That is a lie. But boy, the young people have bought that. What I put on the social media and what I do and want the world to see, I'm seeking approval and affirmation from the response on social media. But the truth is, holiness is far more important than image. God's holiness for our lives. We've traded contentment for choices. The big lie that's out there is today, I have to have choices to be happy. And I can't be happy unless my choices are fulfilled. We don't know how to be content with what we have. The Bible says contentment with godliness is great gain, but we're not content. We get a little bit and we want more. We traded contemplation for distraction. The big lie is I need others to see me. What are you doing now? What's going on? Where are you? We got find me on our phone so we can track each other where we're at. And I'm not saying that's all bad. But understand, the government is tracking us too with these phones everywhere we are. And that can be good, catching criminals, but it can be bad when they decide to control every aspect of our lives. We're addicted, we are addicted to the distraction. And now we can't read well or think dip deeply. We've traded true community for isolation. The big lie is, I don't have to deal with you if I don't want to because I can unfriend you with just a, that's it, man. I got rid of him, got rid of her. But my friend, we're made for human relationships. We're made for community. We can't afford to lose touch with one another. Now, I'm convinced if I don't have a Christian worldview, I will be absorbed by the culture of the world absent the Bible. So if I do not have a Christian worldview, and your children don't have a Christian biblical worldview, they will be absorbed by the worldview of the culture that we're living in today in our world. We need to be like Daniel. He had cultural pressure. He had peer pressure. He had fear pressure. But Daniel had a firm foundation in a biblical worldview. He knew he was a created, created in God's image, and he believed God had a special plan and purpose for his life. He knew his origin. He knew where everything came from. He knew his identity. He knew who he was. He knew his meaning in life. Why am I here? He knew his morality, why and how I should live my life. He knew his destiny, what happens when I die, and it was all based on the word of God. Amen? Do you have your worldview based on the word of God? Notice the last verse of chapter 1. If you, see, if you have it there, it'll be on the screen, I think. Daniel 121, thus Daniel continued until the first year of King Cyrus. Wow. You know what that means? That means Nebuchadnezzar died. His grandson, Belshazzar, died. The next king, Darius, goes off the scene. And the next king is Cyrus. I mean, he lives through almost four kingdoms. And he has a place and position of honor and a place of influence in every one of them. Daniel saw four world empires in King Nebuchadnezzar's vision. Chapter 2, and I'm going to close. I'm about to close in just a minute. But in chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar, he had a dream. Remember that? He dreamed, but he forgot his dream. So he asked his wise men, come in, tell me the dream. And uh, remember what happened? They couldn't tell him. They said, well, you tell us what you dreamed and we'll tell you the interpretation. He said, no, no, anybody could do that. He said, I want you to tell me my dream and the interpretation. And they go, no, there's no person in the world that could do that. And so he says, kill them all. Well, remember, Daniel's one of the wise men. 
So he sends word, says, well, well, just give us a few days. We'll, we'll take care of this. And so he gets a few days. He fasts and he prays for three days with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And uh, then he, God gives him the vision and shows him the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had. I love this story. And so he goes before Nebuchadnezzar and says, let me tell you your dream. And he tells him there was an image, and you saw it had a head of gold and had uh, shoulders of silver and breastplate and the, gold, the chest of, and shoulders of silver. And then goes on down to the feet, part clay and part. Uh, so he saw four world kingdoms, the Babylonian world kingdom, the head of gold, the media Persia world kingdom, the chest of uh, and arms of silver, the Greek world kingdom of be the belly and thighs of bronze, and the Roman kingdom, legs of iron and feet of iron and clay. And then he said, there was a great stone that struck the image and became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. And then he said in verse 44, and in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever. You know what Daniel saw? That great stone was the ancient of days, was Jesus Christ coming back and setting up his kingdom on planet earth. You know why Daniel didn't have to worry, Fred? He wasn't worried about being in a lion's den and lions eating him up. He knew he had a God in heaven who would always be there with him, whether he became lion food or he was able to be saved out of that. He was going to trust his God. Amen? And we need some Daniels today. And what happened after Daniel told this dream to the king? The king answered Daniel and says, Truly, your God is the God of gods, the Lord of lords, and the revealer of secrets, since you could reveal this secret. And I've already read the verses where God, where Nebuchadnezzar promoted Daniel to a place of authority in his kingdom. Now, my friend, you know why I'm not worried about Russia taking over the world? I'm not worried about the Chinese taking over the world, and I'm not worried about the Muslims taking over the world, even though they're all intent on doing that. You know why? Because four kingdoms have already been here, and there's only one fifth kingdom, and it's the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I know next on God's agenda, prophetically, Jesus is coming again. So I don't have to live in fear today. And I can live in confidence knowing. And that's how Daniel had a biblical worldview. God in his word of surety, you can trust him. And I'm just asking today, please pray that we can raise a generation of young people to have a biblical Christian worldview that will be dare to be Daniels in this world in which we live. I can tell you this, Friendly Community Church is committed to that kind of worldview. And I'm excited about what God wants to do through this church. Let's pray. Do you believe the lie or you want to believe the truth? Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And either today you're believing the lie that you don't have to believe in Jesus. There's some other way, but that's a lie. And I can tell you that lie comes from the pits of hell, comes from the devil himself. But the truth is Jesus Christ. His word is true. Not one word has ever failed in this book. And you can either choose to believe that or you can reject that. But you reject it at your own peril. Today, would you believe? Would you say, I believe in Jesus. I believe in the truth. Why should I believe someone who's going to lie to me, who's proven to be a liar, whose end is always death? Would you believe the truth today? And the truth is a person, Jesus Christ. He's the great stone out of heaven that becomes the great mountain that stands forever, Jesus Christ. You can trust him. You can believe him. You can depend on him. You can lean on him. He'll always be there for you. He promised he'll never leave you nor forsake you. Would you trust him today? Would you open your heart to him right now? Would you say, I believe in Jesus. I trust Christ to be the Savior who died on the cross in my place for my sins. My only hope is Jesus. 
You pray the prayer God puts on your heart as you turn from your sin, your way to God's way, the only way that's the true way. And Lord, please help us today. God, we know our country is sin sick, it's humanistic, it's secular, it's denying the God of heaven. It has a form of godliness in many ways, but lives in denial, it lives in a lie. Lord, help us to pray for our young people to be saved in this godless culture like Daniel was. And they'll dare to be different. They'll dare to be a Daniel. Lord, raise up those individuals that'll take a stand wherever they're at to change the culture that they have in their workplace, they have in their neighborhoods. Wherever they're at, we can all be world changers by living out the truths of God's word in our lives. We need your help as we sing. We need your help. Oh God, please help us. And we do ask these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people say, amen and amen and amen.